We're living in a world where there are more problems than solutions. A raging pandemic, climate change, aging, cyber breaches, the list goes on. My name is Ching Shu Yi, and in this series, I and fellow millennial Jermaine Tan will be meeting people our age who think they've got the answer to these problems. Let's do it! It's easy to forget how much technology runs our lives. Being hyper-connected has opened our world, but it's also made us vulnerable to cybercrime. In just one year, cases of cybercrime jumped 50% in 2019, and they're constantly evolving and becoming more sophisticated. So to take down the bad guys, it takes a combination of courage, skill, and determination. A bit like a superhero, really. Except, they don't dress like this. That's more like it. I'm joining forces with young cybercrime fighters. I will visit the underbelly of the internet and even get my phone hacked to find out how we can make our digital world a safer place. Just as fighting physical crimes can often lead to a sinister underworld, combating cyber crimes usually mean venturing into the internet's underbelly. I'm meeting with a young innovator who combats cyber crimes against e-commerce businesses by monitoring what's really happening on the dark web. Li Hengyu first started coding as a rebellious teenager. He hacked security firewalls in his secondary school just so he could play video games during class. Now aged 30, Heng is on the other side of the firewall. He's helping companies to prevent cyber attacks by using AI. E-commerce sites hold a lot of sensitive personal information, so they face threats like data theft, phishing attacks, which leads to stolen data being used in a malicious manner. So how do you monitor such threats? We have a platform that we built in-house called Polaris that helps to protect websites by preventing and predicting attack patterns. Do you shop online? Yes, I do. So do you remember when you register for an account, what kind of information do you share? Uh, my name, All right. my birthday, phone numbers. Okay, and when you try to buy something? My credit card details, mailing address. Yep, so these are the information that one needs to know in order to impersonate you or to just uh, take money off your bank account or even do more nefarious things to you like, you know, stalk you, go to your house. Oh, so how big of a problem this is? The survey last year showed that in 2019, there was actually a quarter of Singaporeans that have been affected by the cyber breaches. Most of them are not aware that they have been compromised. What do the cyber thieves do with this information? Right, they sell this on uh, marketplaces. Here is one of the most famous marketplaces of all time. So you can see digital items like credit card, PayPal account, bank account. It's going for 20 US dollars, which is quite cheap, right? Imagine how much credit you can get out of it. Wait for credit card details. Yeah, that's $20. right. $20. That's right. And it's not just one credit card, you get hundreds of cards. Are you serious? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's how crazy this is. Some of these people's information has been replicated. So you can see a national ID going for $290 here. You mean information that I put online, like my name, date of birth, yeah. could be replicated into an ID card? Yes. I can go to a bank and I can open a bank account, I can verify things, and I can say that I am the true uh, person. So it's stolen identity. That is scary. I don't dare to put any of my information online anymore. Right, right. So I can't find any of these on Google, right? You cannot find any of this on Google. And I can show you more? Sure. Let's go. Until today, I didn't know about this online black market where sensitive personal information is being traded and sold. These illegal marketplaces sit in a place on the web known as the Cyber Underground. 
So you were telling me you have the cybersecurity work that you do? Cybersecurity work involves finding loopholes and vulnerabilities so that we have a better defence strategy. So it's very similar to this uh, exploration of unknown spaces. You just how hard you look for it to find one. And this looking for vulnerabilities, it also takes you to other parts of the internet? Yep. The internet is made out of an intricate web of uh, computers and servers and websites. So very much like this forest over here that you see, what we own is above ground, which is just a very small part of the internet, which we call the surface web. Some estimate that the surface web makes up just 4% of our online world. These are public sites accessible on search engines like Google and Bing. Then there's the deep web. The deep web is actually where the pages online that is not indexed by search engines, like your Facebook page, your social media places, or your government service portals, where you need to log in to see information. How do you help to prevent these threats on this level of the web? It's very much similar to this uh, tunnel system here. You can try to find entrances, see the entrances, to find the loopholes. We are at the deepest part of this underground tunnel. Which part of the web will this be now? This is what we call the dark web. This is where you have to use special encrypted browsers and it promises anonymity to the users and the website owners. There's a lot of spaces where shadowy players like hackers would like to look around. We monitor trading of stolen data or information that could potentially uh, impact our customers. What kind of currency do people use at this part of the web? Uh, it's not cash, I presume. Yeah, definitely not cash. They use digital currencies. So then it offers the user some form of privacy, I presume. Yeah, that's right. So that's where you see a lot of more uh, shadowy and interesting happenings happening down the tunnel. I think it's very, very dark down there. Yeah. Can we go back? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay, let's do that. In the real world, investigators would often break open criminal cases by following the money. After all, illicit cash takings have to be deposited somewhere. But players in the cybercrime underground use complex financial transactions, like wire transfers and shell corporations, to prevent law enforcement from tracking their ill-gotten gains. Then came cryptocurrency which is pseudonymous and receives limited oversight from banks or governments. Bitcoin is now the currency of choice for illegal dark web traders. It is thought to provide the perfect cover for shady players by preventing law enforcement from following an obvious money trail. But when cryptocurrency changes hands, it creates a data trail of transaction on a public ledger called a blockchain. This allows law enforcement to keep following the money. And they unlock this information by hiring blockchain forensic experts. Like Timothy Lin. He knows that cyber criminals are masters at evading detection. So, to stay ahead of the game, Timothy is constantly learning new tricks at the region's first cybersecurity entrepreneur hub, I-71. This is where Siling started. Actually, we started off in a hackathon where we came in second place. Uh, after that, we took part in the I-71 cybersecurity program. You're a trainer as an economist. How did you get into this tech business? It's actually not too different because a lot of it involves the usage of statistics, analyzing data, and understanding behaviors and patterns, and seeing how that maps to, in this case over here, cybersecurity incidents. We pick up various kinds of uh, criminal activities, such as for uh, purchase of drugs, tra child trafficking, even sales of private information, such as uh, passwords and email caches. How can you tell when stolen cryptocurrency is being transferred around? Let me take the Upbeat hack, which happened in 2019. In that incident, about 200 million US dollars was stolen from a South Korean exchange called Upbit. This shows the Upbit hack 
you can see that the funds were transferred from the hacker in November into multiple intermediary wallets that are highlighted in pink. Uh, these funds were then moved to exchange accounts, which are highlighted in green, before being cashed out to the exchange, which are the ones in uh, orange. It involved more than 50,000 wallets and 100,000 transactions. So it's kind of like a crime scene investigation where there are different clues that you have to piece together. I would say it's more of an automated process because with digital payments, everything's happening so fast. So you do need to be able to flag out these incidents as they happen near real time. According to the World Economic Forum, securing our data, our privacy, our networks and our infrastructure, among others, against cyber attacks is the fourth most pressing challenge for our global economy. And it's not going to be easy, which is why law enforcement in this area is often a partnership with the private sector's good guys. Like Tim and Heng, they play absolutely crucial roles in this global fight against cyber threats. But what can we do when the device we take everywhere with us becomes a target for cyber criminals? Preventing cybersecurity threats requires a strong defense. This includes understanding the mindset of the assailant and the strategies needed to prevent their attack. But as with any fight, the best defense is a good offense for knocking out cyber crimes. Nineteen-year-old Tae Gao Jun is a final year IT student and an expert hacker. Luckily for us, he's one of the good guys. Gao Jun is an ethical hacker, known as a white hat hacker. Don't let his questionable graffiti fool you. Gao Jun is the youngest and one of only 150 worldwide to receive top cred as a certified ethical hacker master. Today, Gao Jun is going to show me how he and his friends with the same hacking skills can break into phones like this with ease. Jun. I'm Shui. This is Richard, and this is Shalina here. Hi, nice to meet all of you. So, all of you are hackers here. Yep. Are you telling me that you can hack into this phone? Yes. And what will happen when you guys do that? We are able to see your messages, as well as your location, and we are also able to see both of your front and back cameras. Wait, so you guys can see where I go? Yes. yes. We also can do key logging. Means whatever you type from the phone, we also can see. So if I'm logging into my bank account, you guys can see all the details I'm typing in? Yes, we can. Why do you just take the phone and then we'll get back to you on what we actually find? Okay, so I can roam about and you guys can see what I'm doing? Yep, yes. correct. Okay, I'll see you guys in a bit. Alright. I am one of some 4.65 million smartphone users in Singapore. We carry our phones everywhere and use it for just about everything. And we've never been more at risk from hackers, spying, stealing credentials, and spreading dangerous malware. Hey guys, I'm back. So what do you guys find out? I can see that you went to a cafe over here, as well as I have a recording of your camera when you enter the cafe. Hello. So you guys actually saw me going to the toilet? Yep, we actually have a recording of that too. <gasps> Wait, <laughs> so you recorded the whole thing? That is terrifying. And through this GPS coordinate, I can actually check where you're going. Wow. We even know that you met your friend Keith. Hey Keith! Hey, hi, how are you? My privacy was just violated. I feel very... Paranoid and scared, actually. Young people nowadays, they really like to uh, download free apps. But what they don't know that there might be actually malicious content on the app while they downloaded, making their phone vulnerable to these hackers' attacks. Gao Jun is determined to get young people clued up on cybersecurity. Because as I've just discovered, 
A 2019 survey by Microsoft has found more millennials and teenagers than Generation X and baby boomers in Singapore have encountered at least one form of online risk. 69% for millennials versus 59% for Gen X. Gao Jun has asked me to join him at his alma mater where he's demoing how easy it is to crack social media accounts and I'm going to be his case study. We have Shui account on Instagram. What I want to showcase is called phishing attacks. So normally when you are browsing your Instagram or even your emails, you might come across people sending you spam messages. I have a demo here. Hi Shui, can you check out my new website? And then we have this web link. Sure, let's click on it. <laughs> so now you can see it's actually a replica of Instagram. Now I'm going to get Shui to type in her credential on this phishing website. So this is what the hacker sees. The hacker receives your username as well as your password. I can see that it's Ching underscore Shui, as well as the password is Ching Sui. And now going to head into the real Instagram website. And you can see I'm logged in on Ching Sui account. I have gained access to her Instagram account. Are you surprised what you saw just now? Mm, I've never known that uh, our phones can uh, get hacked that easily. Will you now be more careful when you go online? I'll definitely use the skills that I've been taught from this lesson and be more secure online. I've never really thought about how cyber crimes can affect me directly, but now thinking back at it, there have been numerous times when my friends would send me links and I would click on them without thinking about it. And it makes me wonder if my data has been compromised. And it's not just our personal devices that are at risk. Cyber threats are also lurking in the skies above. Cyber criminals have many opportunities to strike at our hyper-connected nation. But threats don't just lurk online. Criminals have now taken to the skies. Drones have become our eyes in the sky. But it has also provided another entry point for cyber criminals to penetrate Singapore. So, who's safeguarding our skies? determined to win this drone war is 25-year-old Mohammad Shamil. He's a computer scientist who grew up listening to stories from his police force dad. My dad told me that he went on raids to stop vice activities. So that really inspired me to maybe one day to fight crime as well. Drones fascinate Shamil. During COVID, we have seen the usage of drones for monitoring crowds at Bukit Timah and to deliver parcels and food to the ships offshore. But with his background in computer science, Shamil knows that drones can be easily hacked. In his final year at the Singapore Institute of Technology, Shamil and his team developed Drone Vader, a cool tool that assesses the vulnerabilities in drone technology and helps prevent their exploitation by the dark side. What are some of the features that a drone has that can be exploited by hackers? We have the camera and four motors. We have a GPS system also. These are some of the things that can be hacked. So spy movies aren't lying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A drone's ability to fly and take in burst eye views in high-resolution video makes it the perfect tool for surveillance or espionage. Drones can connect to devices like smartphones via Wi-Fi networks and can be used to spy and capture data. Drones can also be hijacked or their GPS systems hacked. 
What kind of research are you guys doing here? Drone is just like a computer which can fly. We need some way to make sure that these drones are secure. I don't want to be in a world where I don't know if that drone is safe for me and for him and everyone around us. So our aim is to find is there a way someone can penetrate into the software by legal means. So what you guys are doing is actually replicating what hackers would do to these drones. Yes, correct. that is correct. Drone waiter system is a suit with all the different pen testing or the attacks for different vulnerabilities on different drones. Why did you guys name it Drone Vader? I am a Star Wars fan, so this is actually inspired by Darth Vader in Star Wars. So we are trying to do good in society. So in order for us to do good, we need to know the bad. Wow, that is a great statement. This is called GPS spoofing. We are basically sending fake GPS signals to the drone. So let's say the drone is an NYP, and from this laptop, we will hack it and send fake GPS signals to tell it that it's in Changi Airport. Changi Airport is a restricted area because of the planes. Drones are restricted from flying there. Oh, so it will actually land? Yes, correct. Fall. It will not allow the user to continue flying. How then can malicious hackers use this? The drones may land onto train tracks or it can fly into key installations in Singapore. So this is not something that we should take lightly. The next attack is the motor hijack and the video hijack. Maybe you can try to operate the drone. Okay. You can see the video stream that's coming up from the drone. So now let's pretend that I'm the attacker. So your video will be cut off. Oh, oh, I cannot see anything anymore. And the video will be shown on my laptop. Oh, so now you can see I cannot see at all. Yes, so this is very dangerous for the operator because you can't really see where your drone is at right now. And they can stop the drone motors from flying. Oh! So then, after knowing all of this, how can Drone Vader help to prevent cyber crimes? Drone Vader helps to exploit the weaknesses of these drones. So you are now aware that this drone can be hacked from a laptop. Organizations may not choose to use these kinds of drones, or they may improve their security systems. Our cyber heroes are protecting us by assessing our device's vulnerabilities. They're delving deep into the dark web and unveiling fraudulent and malicious attacks. There's no limit to the repercussions of cybercrime, from identity theft and impersonation, to the estimated 11.4 million US dollars that businesses around the world will lose each minute. But just as our increased use of technology will make us more vulnerable to cyber criminals, it also gives our Singaporean cyber heroes the tools to stop them. For the rest of us, yes, it's a cliche, but we humans are the weakest link. But we also have the biggest role to play. So the next time you go online, remember, think before you click.